Hello, welcome to Lecture 16 of Electrical Circuits 1. Last time in Lecture 15 we introduced our first electrical energy storage element, capacitors. In this lecture we'll introduce our other energy storage element, inductors. I'll go through this fairly quickly because the governing equations for inductors are similar to those for capacitors except voltage and current have kind of swapped roles for inductors versus capacitors. After we do that, I'll talk a little bit about what are called first order circuits. First order circuits contain a single energy storage element, either an inductor or a capacitor. I'll give you some brief background on those types of systems or circuits and how the solution of the governing equations goes. After that, we'll take a look at our first first order circuit, which will be an RC, which stands for resistor capacitor, contains a single equivalent resistor and a single equivalent capacitor. We'll take a look at the natural response of those. When I talk about first order circuits, I'll also explain what I mean by a natural response. The related educational modules are sections 2.3, 2.4.1, and 2.4.2. Last time when we talked about capacitors, we noted that capacitors store energy in terms of an electric field. Inductors store energy in a magnetic field. And the way these are constructed is typically to coil a conductive wire around some core. And generally, you can increase the inductance by making the core out of some iron-based or ferrite material. The construction is basically as is shown here. You have some wire that is wrapped around this core. If I run a current through this wire, that will create a magnetic flux. This magnetic field will store energy. It's difficult to change that magnetic field instantaneously. Physically, we saw some examples of inductors in lecture B. The construction of those is fairly obviously related to this figure. My circuit symbol for an inductor is as shown here. The symbol sort of denotes the coiled wire construction of the inductor that we saw on the previous slide. Inductance is generally denoted by L. The units of inductance are Henry's. Note my current direction relative to my voltage polarity. Inductors, like capacitors and resistors, are a passive element. I have to assume that current enters the node which is assumed to be at the higher voltage. Okay, I need to stick with my passive sign convention. The inductor voltage current relationships are shown here. The voltage across the inductor, V of t, is the inductance times the rate of change with time of current. V is L D I D T. This is worth memorizing the same way that the voltage current relationship for capacitors and resistors is worth memorizing. Just to reiterate, the voltage current relationship for an inductor in differential form is V of T is L D I of T by D T. Okay? The voltage across the inductor is proportional to the rate of change of the current through the inductor. Now, the same way we did for capacitors, this expression can also be represented in integral form by integrating both sides of this. Multiply through by dt, integrate this side with respect to time, integrate this side with respect to i of t. If we do that, we find that i of t is 1 over L times the integral with respect to time of V of t dt plus some initial current through the inductor. Both of these are worthwhile knowing. If you have to memorize one, I typically remember this one, and then I can integrate that fairly readily to get this one if I need it. Okay, I want to make a couple of quick notes about the characteristics of inductors, and these are extremely important. We'll be using them a lot later when we're analyzing circuits. First, if the current is constant, then the inductor has no voltage difference across it. So, V of t is equal to L di of t by dt. If the current is constant, the rate of change of current with time is zero, and the voltage difference across an inductor is zero. That means that if everything in the circuit is constant, okay, if nothing's changing with time, the inductor can be replaced with a short circuit, and the circuit can be analyzed according to those rules. 
Our second note, if I have a sudden change in current, that will require an infinite voltage. The same voltage-current relationship applies. V of t is L di by dt. If I try to change the current instantaneously, the rate of change of current with time goes to infinity. So infinite voltage is required to change the current suddenly. That means that I would require infinite power in order to do that. I can't have infinite power in any realistic circuit, so the current through an inductor must be continuous. It cannot change suddenly. Now let's talk really briefly about power absorption and generation by inductors and energy storage in inductors. Now this derivation is very similar to what we did for capacitors, so I'll go over it fairly quickly. Power, as always, is the product of voltage and current in electrical circuits. If I replace my voltage with L times di by dt, power for an inductor is L times I of t times the rate of change of current with respect to time. The energy is the time integral of power. So if I take this expression, and I've kind of cavalierly dropped the t's in here, it's understood that my current can be changing with time, I get L di dt by dt, I can pretend to cancel out the dt's, so this becomes L times the integral from minus infinity to some arbitrary time times the integral of I di. This integrates to one half L I squared of t evaluated from time as minus infinity to t. If I assume that at t equals minus infinity there is no energy stored by the inductor, this term goes away and my energy stored in the inductor is one half L times I squared of t. Okay? This emphasizes that energy in the inductor is being stored in the form of a current. The current is what induces the magnetic field that we were talking about at the beginning of this lecture. Okay, now we want to look at series and parallel combinations of inductors the same way we looked at series and parallel combinations of resistors and capacitors. It's sometimes convenient to take combinations of inductors and simplify them down into a single equivalent inductance if that's appropriate. The first case we're going to look at are series combinations of inductors. So I'm going to take n inductors, L1, L2, on up to L sub n, and I'm going to place them in series with a voltage source, V of t. Now since these are in series, they all share the same current, I of t. They do not, however, necessarily have the same voltage difference across each inductor. Inductor L1 will have voltage V1 of t, L2 will have V2 of t, on up to L sub n, which will have V sub n of t. Now we can use our inductor voltage current relationships to write these voltages in terms of this current. So for example, V1 of t is equal to L1 di by dt. V2 of t is equal to L2 times the derivative of current with respect to time on down to the voltage difference V sub n of t, which is L sub n times the derivative of current with respect to time. Now if we do KVL around this loop, we see that V of t is the sum of all of these voltages. If I substitute in the appropriate term for each of these voltages, I get V of t is L1 di by dt plus L2 di by dt plus a bunch of other terms up to L sub n di dt. All of these terms share the di dt multipl multiplicative factor. I can factor that out and rewrite this as a sum of inductances times di by dt. This looks like an equivalent inductance which is just the sum of the individual inductances. So I can write this as an equivalent inductance times di by dt. Okay? I'll summarize this on the next slide. 
So as I mentioned on the previous slide, I can take a series combination of inductors and represent them as a separate circuit with a single equivalent inductance. So this circuit here with these n inductors is indistinguishable from this circuit with a single equivalent inductance as long as LEQ is the sum of these individual inductances. So LEQ is L1 plus L2 on up to L sub n. So I add up all the individual inductances in the series combination. That becomes my equivalent inductance. Okay, if you want to, in the back of your mind, think of inductors in series adding in much the same way that resistors in series add, that will be fine with me. You just sum up the individual inductances in a series combination. You would sum up the individual resistances in a series combination. Now I'm going to do something similar for parallel combinations of inductors. If I have n inductors, L1, L2, on up to L sub n, which are in parallel with each other and in parallel with a current source, okay. the individual voltages across these inductors are all the same by definition of parallel elements. They're all going to be V of t. However, the individual currents will not necessarily be the same. Okay, I can have I1 of t through L1, I2 of t through L2, and I sub n of t through L sub n. Now, the way I would analyze this is to write each of these currents in terms of the integral of the voltages, according to our integral voltage current relationship for inductors, and then apply KCL at this upper no node to sum all of these and set those equal to this individual current coming into that node. Now, we've been through that process several times. I don't really fe feel the reason to do the details of the derivation. What I will do is simply state that this circuit is equivalent to a single equivalent inductance where the inverse of the equivalent inductance is the sum of the inverse of each of the individual inductances. So I take one over each of these inductances, sum those up, take one over the result to get this equivalent inductance. So think in terms of adding resistors in parallel. Inductors in parallel add very similarly to resistances in parallel. Let's do a quick example of series and parallel combinations of inductors. I have this set of inductors. I want to look into these terminals and determine the equivalent inductance of this combination. These two inductors are in parallel with one another. They share the same set of nodes. I can simplify those down to a single equivalent inductance. That equivalent inductance will then be in series with this two millihenry inductance. So my first step is going to be to combine these two here to get a single inductance. This two millihenry inductance here doesn't change yet. This is still my equivalent inductance. This inductance here is going to be 1 over 1 over 6 millihenries plus 1 over 3 millihenries, which is equal to 6 times 3 over 6 plus 3, which is 2 millihenries. 18 over 9 is 2. These inductors are now in series. To get the overall inductance of that combination, I simply add these two inductances. So LEQ is 2 millihenries plus 2 millihenries is an overall inductance of 4 millihenries.